Welcome to Plug Life Television. Today's episode is the first part of the Plug Life Manifesto on rail travel. Now, rail travel has traditionally been quite a backwards sector, quite reluctant to change, quite happy to stick with the status quo, which in Scotland is largely diesel. So, whilst I will be discussing some cutting-edge energy storage technologies later in the episode, we're actually going to begin with a surprising bit of common sense. Scotland has seen a number of improvements to its railway network over the past decade. New routes have been built, including the Glasgow to Edinburgh via Airdrie and Bathgate line, and the Borders line. Also, existing routes have been electrified, including Glasgow to Edinburgh via Falkirk, and routes between Glasgow and Dublin. Despite this progress, only 25% of Scotland's existing track is electrified, with plans to increase this amount by only 10% by 2032. Although admittedly, this will cover the majority of passenger numbers. However, the remaining 75% of non-electrified track has a serious problem. No one wants to buy diesel rolling stock. In addition to the obvious environmental concerns, diesel rolling stock is less reliable than its electric counterparts due to the increased number of moving components and is more expensive to fuel and maintain. Additionally, several major electrification projects have been announced across the UK in recent years which deter train operators from wanting to invest in diesel stock. As soon as the line is electrified, the diesel stock becomes a stranded asset. This lack of appetite for diesel rolling stock has a number of implications. Firstly, existing diesel stock is ageing, and the diesel engine and their particulate filters are often as old as the rolling stock itself, which creates reliability and pollution issues. A lack of investment in new diesel rolling stock leads to overcrowding on non-electrified routes as passenger numbers grow. These problems are further exacerbated by continually postponed and cancelled electrification projects in England and Wales, meaning that these routes have to cling on to their ageing diesel stock for even longer. From a mechanical perspective, diesel rolling stock is far from ideal. All ScotRail diesel multiple units have diesel hydraulic transmission, which means they are slow to accelerate and become bottlenecks on busy routes. In fact, more services could be run on existing routes if we electrified the rolling stock. The Plug Life Manifesto on Rail has a four-step decarbonisation plan, the first of which is the cheapest to implement, make full use of the existing overhead lines that Scotland already has. This may seem blindingly obvious, but unfortunately there are several cases where this is not done. The East Coast Main Line is electrified from London all the way to Glasgow and Stirling, whilst onward sections to Aberdeen and Inverness are not electrified. Most East Coast Main Line services to Scotland terminate at Edinburgh. LNER have a fleet of Class 91 electric locomotives for the electrified routes, and HSTs to cope with non-electrified sections of track. Despite this, LNER regularly run HSTs on services that terminate at Edinburgh, having run on an entirely electrified section of track. Similarly, the West Coast Main Line is fully electrified from London to Glasgow and Edinburgh, which allows Scotland to be served by Virgin's large fleet of electric pendolinos rather than diesel voyagers. Yet, Virgin routinely run voyagers on services to Scotland, a matter that I've previously pulled them up on via Twitter. The Plug Life Manifesto mandates that all fully electrified routes may only be served by fully electric trains, with the use of diesel trains permitted on non-electrified routes in the short term as long as they serve at least one non-electrified station and all serviceable non-electrified stations up to the terminus. Every failure to comply will result in substantial fines for the train operating company, with repeat offenders being stripped of their rail franchise. LNER should have little issues complying with this legislation, since they can simply run their HSTs north to at least Fife or Perth. However, for Virgin Trains, the 100% electrified West Coast Main Line from London to Scotland presents them with an issue. The solution is to reroute their diesel voyagers through the Glasgow South West Line from Carlisle to Glasgow, where the Plug Life Manifesto will require them to serve every station with a platform long enough for the train along the way. As well as ensuring that fully electrified routes are only used by electric trains, this policy will provide much needed additional services to underserved communities such as Dumfries and Kilmarnock. The first part of the Plug Life Manifesto on rail is as follows. The use of diesel rolling stock on fully electrified Scottish routes is banned with immediate effect. This includes cross-border services. Diesel services shall only be allowed on routes that serve at least one non-electrified station in Scotland and every serviceable station along the non-electrified route in question. So now that some common sense has been applied to Scotland's railway network, 
the Plug Life Manifesto can start to focus on cutting edge tech, with step two of its rail decarbonisation plan jumping the gaps between electrified sections of track. Parts of the East Coast Main Line and Glasgow to Aberdeen Line are already electrified, but everything north of Edinburgh on the former and Dunblane on the latter relies on diesel traction. Given the high passenger numbers on these routes, overhead electrification makes perfect economic sense. However, there are a number of obstacles to contend with, including low bridges and tunnels, and the fourth rail bridge, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The solution is to electrify as much of these lines as possible, allowing the train to run off of overhead lines when they are present. Then, when the overhead line runs out, the train switches to an onboard energy storage system that allows it to propel itself for at least five miles. This would then be charged using the overhead lines on the next electrified section of track. A five mile range allows a smaller energy storage system to be installed, which saves weight, volume and cost. However, for a smaller battery, a given load will be a higher C rate than the same load on a larger battery. For example, a 1000 kilowatt load is 4C for a 250 kilowatt hour battery, but only 1C for a 1000 kilowatt hour battery. As a result, the smaller battery is worked harder, gets hotter and fails quicker. Lithium ion cells, which store electrochemical energy, are often considered for energy storage applications. However, for short range applications, supercapacitors, which store electrostatic energy, may also be suitable. On charge, electrons are moved to the anode, which makes the anode negatively charged and the cathode positively charged. As such, positive ions in the electrolyte are attracted to the anode and negative ions towards the cathode. Since the ions are only attracted by charge of the electrode and don't go on to form part of its physical structure like in a lithium ion battery, this energy can be released very quickly on discharge, giving supercapacitors exceptional power density. A lack of mechanical expansion and contraction of the electrodes means that their lifespan is upwards of a million cycles. Supercapacitors also have a wide operating temperature window and are tolerant of typical UK temperature extremes. However, their energy density is lower than lithium ion cells. There is another issue with supercapacitors that arises from their method of operation. Unlike batteries, during discharge, supercapacitors have a linear drop in voltage, meaning that they drop below the minimum voltage of typical applications when they still contain a considerable amount of their energy, effectively locking out much of their usable capacity. If supercapacitors cannot provide enough usable energy for the application in question, high power lithium ion chemistries could help. Lithium titanate anodes, negative electrodes, experience very little expansion and contraction during cycling and will allow the rapid intercalation or pigeonholing and deintercalation of lithium ions. As a result, they support very high rates of rapid charging and discharging and leading commercial examples such as the Toshiba Skib have lifespans of over 10,000 cycles. Their energy density is lower than lithium ion cells made from conventional materials but higher than supercapacitors. Lithium iron phosphate cathodes, positive electrodes, also support high charge and discharge rates and are regularly used in electric buses. But it is highly unlikely that you will find lithium titanate anodes and lithium iron phosphate cathodes in the same cell. This is because the voltage of a cell is its potential difference between the cathode and the anode. Since stored energy is dependent on cell voltage, the higher the cell voltage, the greater the energy it can store. Most lithium ion cells use a combination of a cobalt containing cathode and a carbon anode to achieve the highest cell voltage and therefore the highest energy density. Since the potential of lithium iron phosphate cathodes is lower than cobalt containing cathodes and the potential of lithium titanate is higher than that of graphite, a cell using these two electrodes would have a low voltage and therefore a low energy density. It is far more common to find lithium iron phosphate cathodes paired with graphite anodes and lithium titanate anodes paired with cobalt containing cathodes. Regardless of this, there are at least three good energy storage options that could propel the train a short distance whilst permitting high charge and discharge rates, a wide operating temperature window and a long cycle life. These energy storage technologies could easily allow the busiest sections of non-electrified track in Scotland to be electrified. The second part of the Plug Life Manifesto on Rail is as follows. The East Coast Main Line and Fife Circle north of Edinburgh and the line between Dunblane and Dundee shall be fully electrified using conventional overhead lines, with the exception of low bridges and tunnels and the fourth rail bridge. Orders for electric rolling stock with autonomous capability of at least five miles provided by batteries or supercapacitors shall be placed immediately, with a minimum of four cars per service. Diesel rolling stock on the aforementioned routes shall be banned three years from the date of the policy coming into effect unless the train operating company can provide evidence of a delay to an order placed within six months of the policy coming into effect. 
so now we know that it's entirely possible to jump the gaps between electrified sections of track. We'll look at how to decarbonise short regional services without overhead lines and longer and high speed non electrified routes in the next episode of Plug Life Television. So there we go, it's entirely possible to fully electrify Scotland's busiest railway routes already, and there are multiple ways to do it. Next time, we'll be looking at some of the more difficult routes to electrify and the technology that will finally displace diesel once and for all. <laughs>